everybody, and welcome to this latest edition of Breaking Down Barriers, where we're going to be looking about the topic around seeking support, but also getting involved. It can be a really challenging thing to step forward and share your experience with Huntington's disease or even acknowledge it in a public setting or even to someone else on a one-on-one -on -one setting. So we wanted to bring some of the community members together to talk about their experiences. So I'm excited to have some wonderful ambassadors joining us today and I'll have them introduce themselves and I'll start off with Brent. Hi, I'm Brent uh, from Canada. I uh, live just outside Toronto. Uh, I, my dad had Huntington's uh, and passed away a while ago. And so obviously runs in my family. Um, similar thing that kind of that reaching out and breaking the barriers of talking to people is something that's I've struggled with myself. So certainly a barrier that I'm familiar with. Yeah. Thanks so much for being here, Brent. Hannah. Hi, I'm Hannah Rimlard. I am from Manitoba, which is located in Canada, and my connection to HD is through my mom. Um, she got diagnosed when she was 24, and then me and my brother were told about it when I was about, I think, seven years old at the time, and we also found out after my Auntie Pat had passed away that she had Huntington's disease as well. Thank you for sharing that, and I think it will be an interesting conversation um, with the combination of when you all were able to reach out and get further involved, um, which I think will be really helpful. I'm also going to introduce Zoe. So oh, I'm Zoe, obviously. Um, I've been involved with the HD community since 2008, 2009, because that's when my dad got diagnosed. And pretty much straight away, I wanted to be involved in like some kind of volunteering aspect like well, I've always kind of volunteered with other groups Um, obviously you could probably tell by my accent from Scotland so I worked with the SHA for a really long time Um, I'm still technically a youth ambassador but I'm not that young anymore Um, but I did a lot of volunteering to them and then off the back of that I met Matt who at the time was the director of HDO and then uh, just kind of started doing different bits and bobs and then I can't remember what year I signed up to be an ambassador but I did at some point in time and then uh, I've kind of from that it's been really good though because I got to meet people from like a bunch of different places like outside the UK um, and I just try and get involved with things as and when I can. So from your experiences and feel free to jump in uh, don't need to go down the line but from your experiences why is it important for young people to get involved in the community in whatever way it works out best for them? I think for other people to get involved uh, just with such a rare disease uh, especially but I, I feel like all humans can kind of feel that way is we can feel isolated very easily, especially with Huntington's and such a rare disease. And so I would say kind of getting involved and reaching out and talking to people in the communities is just a great way to see that other people have the exact same thoughts, the exact same stories as you without ever having talked or cross paths or anything like that. So it feels very isolating. It can feel very uh, kind of, being connected to something bigger, recognizing that other people have those same stories, but go through that exact same thought processes as you and stuff like that. Um, yeah, uh, I feel like I lost my train of thought there. Anna? <laughs> um, yeah, so I think it's important for young people to get involved in the HD community, because it does give you a sense of like, a second family in a way it expands kind of your view of Huntington's disease and as we normally call it our Ohana which is you know our Ohana family um which is the chosen family and I think it's just really really great to have that because it shows you that you're not alone you have the understanding the empathy and the support from people who get it and you don't have to walk into a room and be like okay this is what Huntington's disease is like let me break this down for you before I can get that support because mm -hmm. others already know what it is and you have to you get to like skip that step if that makes sense does it change I'm always curious about this because I feel like when you have to be vulnerable with someone by sharing your experiences and they're not a part of the HD community do you feel like that's heavy on you because then you feel a burden to have to educate them and it kind of takes away from some of the needs that you might have in that specific conversation if you're asking for support or even just going about day-to-day -day lives? Um, I think it can be frustrating in a professional setting. Like if I'm talking to a therapist, then it's a little bit like, oh, I have to educate you before you can help me. 
if that makes sense. But I think in everyday life, when it comes to like friends, strangers, acquaintances, I take pride in educating others about HD because it's something I'm really, really passionate about. And I've been involved in since I was like little, little. So um, I have no problem with that. I think same thing when talking to kind of therapists and stuff like that going through. I struggled with mental health for a long time, still do a little bit from time to time. I think we all probably do. Um, but yeah, having to explain and going through so many professionals and having to explain to them, is this HD versus mental health and have that conversation about, well, how do I know? And my answer has to kind of be, I don't really know because I wouldn't be able to tell, but you have to like, you're confident in who you are and whether it's Huntington's or not. Uh, and so having those conversations can be tough. I, I had to talk to a number of different kind of professionals in that way and kind of walk that line and get them on board with what I kind of believed about myself, essentially. Um, and yeah, that was kind of reminding me of what I was going to say before. Certainly, I find that big, a little bit more frustrating, like you said, uh, when dealing with people who aren't familiar with HD, like my close friends even, uh, talk to them about stuff. And often they have some reactions and some things to say that are always a little bit, I don't know, not something you necessarily want to hear in that moment or come from a, a little bit of ignorance, no fault of their own. They're trying to be nice uh, and everything and understanding, but it comes from a little bit of ignorance. And it can be a little bit frustrating with your conversation. That's what I think reaching out and getting involved in a community is helpful. Like Hannah said, uh, having that community that already knows and already you can skip that step uh is a great thing and i find at least personally for me people that are very close to me they know but a lot of times we really feel like we don't want to burden them because they already have their own hd burden and their own hd kind of thoughts and things to deal with but then like i said the friends who are not as familiar it's a frustrating conversation to have sometimes and they only want to come up so often again they feel uncomfortable talking about it. Sometimes they feel like maybe we're too fragile to talk about it, so they don't want to bring it up, stuff like that. So it's hard to actually sit down and have a good conversation with those people, in my yeah. opinion. So it sounds yeah. like getting involved in having that support takes that completely out of it. Yeah. So then you can just really focus on the needs of the conversation at hand. Anna? Exactly, yeah. Um, I think also just like sometimes how people react if you're talking to a friend about your situation, they often want to relate to you and make you feel like you're not alone, but they struggle with that. So they might share a struggle of theirs that has nothing to do with HD. And that is absolutely valid, but it's like a completely different thing to juggle. Mm -hmm. um, and then you feel like you have to comfort them to be like, no, 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 like that's also valid. That's also an important struggle that you have. And then it kind of flips the switch, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely. Thanks for sharing that. I just have always, I think it's such an important piece of the conversation and it plays into getting involved because it shows the daily struggles of just of, of your own support system, but the importance of having another support system where you already have that wall taken down, where you don't have that added burden to those conversations. So I'm curious, what was the reason why both of you wanted to reach out and get further involved? And what were some of those fears and thought processes you went through? And um, and was it something that was easy to do? Was it something that took some time and kind of evolved? What was that experience like? Um, I think it's really important to get involved because when I was young, so my dad got diagnosed, like I said, it was about 2008, 2009 he got ill. Um, and at the time, there wasn't really much that I could look up. Um, just all the horrible stuff on the internet, like when you first Google it. Um, and I, to me, it was really important that there was stuff that people could access that was more sort of like at their level, at their stage. Like if you're a young person, you didn't need to be reading like big medical journals or anything like that. You need stuff that's broken down in simple language. You need to hear from your peers, stuff that's going to benefit you rather than just scare you. Um, and that's something that was really important to me. Um, I, I think, I can't remember how I reached out. Um, I feel like it might have been Facebook was because that seemed to be a big thing for a while. Um, but I also, like, I'm quite lucky. So my mum knew Matt really, really well, because uh, when my dad first got diagnosed, my mum and Matt, Matt met on, like, a youth forum thing, because my mum was trying to find a space um, for us to find out about stuff. So that was quite, we were kind of lucky in that sense. Um, so, like, I've known Matt for, like, a really long time, which then meant I always heard about HDO 
Um, so then it just felt natural to want to get involved because I knew that they were always doing good things because I was always seeing that he was traveling the world and stuff like that. And then obviously over the years it's progressed and became like this huge big thing now, um, which is like amazing. And it's nice to see that there's a community that people from anywhere can get involved in some kind of way. Because um, I think that's really nice as well because I know that in certain places, like I'm quite lucky where I am that uh, I have access to support, but I know that people in different countries don't. And that's a, a huge thing that would be like I could I couldn't imagine being a young person growing up in a country that didn't have support. So at least if you can get something like through the internet or meet people sort of some kind of way, like it will make a big difference to you. Um, I think for me personally, like I've been involved before I even knew what HC was. My family is going to like the go kart fundraiser here in Manitoba, um, and we would fundraise every single year. So that was always something that we would do. We would go to like the Christmas party every year. Um. But then I started to get more and more in the community after my Auntie Pat had passed away and my parents told me about HD and that my mom has it and that my Auntie Pat had it. Um, so I attended my first ever conference in Canada when I was, I think I was about nine years old at the time. Um, and that's kind of when I first got introduced to YPAD. And I also got introduced to the mentorship program, so I got involved in that way. Um, and then it kind of evolved from there as my mom progressed throughout her disease. Um, so when I was 14, I became a caregiver for my mom more. And that's when I started to go to more and more events across Canada. I also went to my first ever HTYO camp in 2018, which was just a phenomenal experience. And there was really nothing else like it. My dad told me and my brother that we came back as completely different people and it was for the better. And we just kind of had that passion and that fire that lit under us to get more and more involved um yeah. and then so when i was 14 i became the social media coordinator for uh the manitoba chapter here in canada and then i focused on that and caregiving for my mom this past october she got put into a care home so i've had time to kind of get more involved and it's evolved even more from there i'm an hdyo ambassador now um, i continue to attend events I'm the social media coordinator for YPAD here in Canada, which is young people affected by Huntington's disease. And I'm also writing a chapter in the book, Positively Rare, that's coming out this fall, um, talking about the struggles and the impacts of being a caregiver while also growing up, so. So do you feel like, I mean, that's a lot and 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 you got involved really early and part of that was with kind of the family structure and communication when things were happening that were that were relevant to your family and Huntington's disease. Do you feel like you had to propel yourself forward with kind of seeking out that support and those different resources? Was it a family decision? Um, how much did that play into it? Um, so it kind of started off with my parents pushing me mm -hmm. a little bit to be like, hey, like there's this wider community that you can get to know. Um, they also got me in counseling really, really early on. I kind of did that through support. Um, so at first it was a little bit of a push, but then after like my first event and first, you know, connections with people, I just kind of loved it from there. Um, it was scary at first, definitely being in a room and being like, oh, we're all affected by one rare disease. Like, is this gonna be awkward? Is this gonna be just like a horrible experience of like, oh, we all kind of got dealt this crappy hand. Is it all gonna be a negative look? But it really, really wasn't. And that was just amazing to see and kind of learn through this mm -hmm. process, so. That's great, thanks for sharing. Brent, I know that you mentioned at the beginning that you kind of struggled a little bit with with the notion of reaching out for support and um, and getting involved. Love to hear how you got started in some of those processes. For sure. Um, I think part of kind of me getting involved was actually, I mentioned kind of having some mental health struggles. I think I was at a little bit of a kind of low point with my mental health in particular uh, a number of years ago, probably about four years ago now. Um, and I kind of had a major breakthrough and it was kind of giving me the confidence to kind of get out there again, because I knew in the back of my head, I've always kind of wanted to a little bit and felt like I could be reaching out a little bit more. Um, but yeah, kind of sounds like a little bit the opposite of Hannah there, where she got started very early. Uh, and mine was always kind of, I hate to say it, but that typical kind of male mentality of kind of doing everything on my own and 
it being weak to reach out, right? Being strong that I have to just carry this on my own and stay quiet and stay private about things. Um, and my family, I think, was very similar uh, mentality. Obviously, we all very supportive. My mom, uh, my brother and myself um, and love each other very much, but we're all very private individuals and we all think the same way, as I mentioned before, of you don't want to overburden the other people in your family because maybe they're dealing with too much right now and they don't have time to talk to me, that sort of thing. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that's where I started to reach out and get involved was when I kind of had that breakthrough and had a little bit more confidence. The other mm -hmm. side of it a little bit too is I, I'm a teacher. Uh, so once you're teaching, you're kind of, kind of in the public. I know not to a large degree, but you're in the public eye. So People are always kind of watching what you're doing, especially I teach high school. So especially teens are always just searching you up, finding stuff on you. They find the littlest thing and they run away with it. So uh, I was a little bit nervous with that. And one of my mentalities, I think, which was a good mentality when I was younger, but like I said, kind of in hindsight, held me back from reaching out was that I didn't want HD to divine me. Uh, I, I was going to kind of keep it to myself because I wanted people to think I was a good person, a teacher, a good teacher, a good coach, whatever, not, oh, he has Huntington's and he still does those things, but to kind of do it on their own and not kind of, kind of have that sympathy or pity almost, uh, which again, which has kind of held me back in, in some regards. I should have maybe pushed past that and something maybe I could push beyond that stigma. I think a little bit of a, a male mentality there to some degree. Um, but I think ultimately it was just kind of the same thing. Like I said, I had the back of my head that I always was going to, uh, and for the same reasons I kind of got into teaching and coaching, uh, is that kind of my ultimate goal is just to be a positive male role model, essentially, mm -hmm. and recognizing that not that I'm anyone important or special by any means, uh, but you're recognizing that sometimes that's just showing up and, and being, saying the odd thing and being a male role model that maybe a handful of people see and then that causes them to then influence a handful of other people and it kind of snowballs from there. So I, I think I kind of go, got into teaching with that uh, mentality and, and I had the same mentality when it came to kind of sharing eventually with Huntington's. I was always worried some of the fears there, uh, like I said, is just kind of being vulnerable and and getting things out there and especially coming from my whole life of being so, so private about it. Very few people still kind of know my full story. I would say maybe a handful uh, of my closest people in my life. I share my kind of full entire background with other people. I'm still a little guarded with because I kind of let them come along uh, when I feel like is appropriate essentially. And part of that also kind of comes from the teaching thing where mm -hmm. I'm in charge of students and individuals. And I even kind of talked to my union rep about this at one point when I said about kind of speaking up a little bit more and being about a little bit more vocal now that I'm more established. I feel a little bit better about that. Uh, when you're newer, people are always kind of, you're, you're under the microscope a little bit. Now that I'm a little more established in my teaching career, I feel like I, I can do things the way I want a little bit more often and people are going to give me that. Uh, free space but I, I talked to the union member about it and he he said that he sh that I shouldn't that I should kind of hold that card back a little bit and uh, because being in charge of children obviously people could say if I start having a bad day bad week bad month bad year even just mentally and like physically and just having uh, doing a few things out of the normal then people even my bosses and and people might be looking at that in terms of, oh, is that a Huntington's dis, uh, symptom early and can he still be in charge of children, stuff like that. So I was worried about that front a little bit to some degree at the very uh, beginning. Mm -hmm. But I think, uh, unfortunately, that is kind of a stigma that exists. Do you feel like, have you experienced any, either of you, any discrimination as you've kind of been more vocal about Huntington's disease and how it impacts you because I think that is a big fear yeah mm -hmm. I less than I thought I think mm -hmm. same thing kind of that Hannah mentioned a second ago going and thinking it might be this negative thing and being surprised that it's mostly positive similar thing that I kind of 
was worried and expected a lot of those stigmas to be there and people to kind of greet my information in, in a certain way, my story in a certain way. And I've been, yeah, I think more pleasantly surprised than not. Mm -hmm. There still is the odd person that doesn't react in the best way possible. But I think for the most part, it was, yeah, not as bad as I had in my head. For me, um, I feel like um, I went in and I was scared about it. But um, for the longest time, I didn't face any, you know, kind of hardships about it. Everyone was really, really supportive around me. Um, and then this past year, my mom's extended family, who's also affected by Huntington's disease, they're not as involved in the community as we are. Um, but there was a video that I did for YPAD about my testing experience and how I tested negative for Huntington's disease. Um, my brother had also done one in the past. And so one of our extended family members actually commented on the post and said, how is it that two family members can be both be negative if it's 50%. Like one of them has to be lying because they didn't have that education behind it. Um, and so that was a little bit different to deal with. Um, thankfully our chapter president for the YPAD exec commented back and just said, hey, like here's a list of, you know, some genetic info if you wanna check out this website about Huntington's disease and find out more. Um, but yeah, so that was something that I didn't really expect when I was getting involved was kind of the the pushback from extended family, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think that's, a, I mean, I think that that can happen. And um, it's, you're putting yourself out there. And especially when you yeah. look at the different spectrum of that, and you know, when you go to social media, you really open yourself up for comments and feelings and thoughts um, to people that you would never expect it. And I think mm -hmm. what's great about these stories is that it really showcases the difference of how you can make this your own journey. And it really depends on what you're ready for, what you have access to, what you feel comfortable with. Um, and I think that sometimes when people hear the word getting involved or reaching out, they think of um, some really forward facing things like participating in fundraisers or sharing your story on social media or putting themselves in a, in a really leaping too far deep into the pool of, of getting yourself out there and being in the community. But it's, it's such a spectrum. It's things like trying it out, just like Brent said about, um, his first way of reaching out and getting involved was actually supporting himself and through advocacy for himself. And I think that people don't give themselves credit enough for doing that. Watching this video is a way of getting involved because you're openly listening to other stories. And that's, that's the power of social media and online programs is that you can do so in a way where you're at the safety behind a screen, where you're not having to label yourself, where you have that sense of protection. But that's also a way of doing it. And then you have more and more and more. But I think it's important for people to know that it, it ebbs and flows based off of what's going on in your life and what you're ready for. And that's okay. And if anybody is like, no, you, you know, you have to do this, Y, you know, X, Y, and Z, and it's too much for you. And they put the pressure on you. It's fine to take a step back. It's fine to take a break. That's completely normal. And that's how it's all designed. Yeah. So I think it's definitely valid that it ebbs and flows and like, that's completely natural for myself personally. Um, I was involved when I was very young, but I did take like a year or two break during COVID because the caregiving for my mom was getting really, really hard. And I was going through some mental health challenges at the time. Um, and so it's incredibly valid to take a step back. And like the one thing about this community that's really amazing is that they're very, very understanding if you need to take a step back because we're all there for each other at the end of the day. And that's all that matters. Um, so yeah. Can I throw something about the pleasant reactions? <laughs> uh, back to the the kind of pleasant surprises when you talk to people. I, my closer circle, everyone was kind of so proud of me whenever I did. I know, obviously, I kept it to myself, but you run into a lot more people that are very proud that you took that step and, uh, yeah, proud that you did that uh, that work and put yourself out there. Yeah, I really like what you said, especially about... Um when you're seeking out information, it's important for the information that you're ready for and yeah. information that would be helpful. And sometimes 
sometimes it is research news. Sometimes it is news about genetics where you're getting deep into the science, but sometimes you just need to talk about the the day-to-day experiences and what that looks like. And that's why you don't have that support unless you kind of put yourself out there. And again, that whole spectrum of what does that support and what is that building the community around you look like for you, I think is where you need to really think, what do I need to gain out of this? And who can I reach out to get more help or or what have you is really important. Yeah, it's like for people that are young carers, they might have questions about like, what did someone do with like regards eating or something like that? Um, Like you can ask that to like a generic young carers group, but obviously everybody's parent might have different conditions and there is a lot of things that are really specialized to HD. So being able to communicate with people that are in that community like it makes it so much easier because they'll, they'll just get it. They just understand all the sort of things that you're going through. Whereas someone whose parent maybe has like cancer, for example, like they'll understand the struggle of having to care for a parent, but it's not the same kind of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Small, small, relatable things, but not the exact same situation. Um, Cause there are so many nuances that can happen. And, and it's also helpful. Um, so, and I'll talk a little bit more about the ambassador program through HDYO, but through our chat, um, you just see people pile on in the best of ways with sharing experiences or guidance or what worked with them or people saying, oh, I never thought about that. Or even people who maybe aren't there yet, maybe their parent hasn't gone through those those similar symptoms yet, but even for future knowledge, it's just really helpful. And it's um, it's amazing to see. And you know, that's not just that's not just for the ambassadors, that's for any kind of support system that you build there's just that safety and that care and that love to get some of those key questions answered or just know that your experiences are valid and that other people have gone through them is so helpful i think uh i think with that piece about kind of the information that's ready for you too is it's a good way of uh casually coming across the information as opposed to sitting down by yourself and thinking oh this is going to be really heavy and dense and I'm going to have to go through this thing and read through it, but having just being involved allows you to kind of casually have information pop up as you're talking to other people kind of thing. Well, that's also, that's a great point because that's how we also share about um, talking about Huntington's disease to, to young people and to children is it needs to be digestible. It needs to be age appropriate. And it also needs to be at the pace that that, that child or that young person is ready for it. Because if you, it is a very heavy subject and it's a very complicated subject too. So if you're if you're too young and you're getting bombarded with information and to your, your point, Brent, about being in your home, Googling and hearing all these things, you know, is that the right method for finding out about that information? Or is there a way that you can build that community and support around you? So then when you're ready, you can kind of dive further into some of those more serious things that, um, that can be really frightening to look at, but um, like, you know, the underlying hope and the community around that is so important for that. For sure. What has surprised you about getting involved um, or seeking out support? Weirdly, like how sim- easily some people will just chat with you. Like people that you've never met, you're probably never going to meet them because they live like a million miles away from you and they'll just happily chat with you about like quite in- intimate things sometimes. Um, and I think like you almost have like an instant connection which is quite nice because it's you struggle to find that especially as I find as you get older it can be harder to make like that kind of connection and make friends and stuff like that it's not the same as when you're in school and you're just friends because you both like spider-man or something um like as you get older it becomes a bit more difficult um so like knowing that you're kind of welcomed into the community almost instantaneously is really nice for sure uh I think maybe just nerves for me it was a little bit surprising because I mean, not that I'm overly nervous about talking about things, but I'm surprised. I was surprised by how much kind of at the very first time of saying something, I got some nerves going when I'm talking and stuff like that. Um, but as we've kind of talked about already, a lot of the surprises were kind of more pleasant surprises, things that I was nervous about. But then once you start talking about it, you said people are proud of you, people are positively interacting with you, not being negative. Uh, yeah, so a lot of the surprises were on the good end too. 
Yeah, for me, I think I was surprised by kind of like the passion and the drive to continue getting involved um, because I already had a lot on my plate caregiving for my mom, but it was just something that I was like, oh, like I really, really want to do this. Um, and then as for the sport, it really surprised me how much it like kind of helped me throughout my mom's progression and being able to hear everyone else's stories and kind of take that in and be like, okay, somebody else went through this this way or the other person went through it that way. How do I want to go through it? And getting that chance to kind of think about it and not necessarily like learn from mistakes or learn from regrets of others, but just kind of be able to pre-plan. And then also now that I'm more and more involved is the opposite that I'm surprised that like I'm able to help share my story now and teach others. And it's kind of nice to have that 180 and be able to give back to the community for sure. Do you feel that you're going to kind of spawn another question that I have? Um, I think one of the things about building your support system, getting involved, seeking support is also you're building this community of people when you need them, you know where to first take that step to find out more information or get support. Is that, is that, is that how you all feel? Yeah, I think so. It's kind of like a bridge step, right? Where things always seem overwhelming, especially when you're dealing with something, as we said, so complex and huge. And it's that little bridge step that is easy. I can just reach out and talk to people casually. It doesn't have to be this big ordeal in my head that I'm going to look things up and, and yeah. kind of spiral and I don't know where to go from there kind of thing. But even they, they might not be able to give you the answer, but they'll be able to tell you who, who to go to. Mm -hmm. So like, oh, we took my parent to this kind of doctor or we took my family member to this kind of specialist. And then you're like, right, okay, I can then speak to my doctor about that kind of thing. Whereas like you might never have thought of that because no one's ever mentioned it. Yeah, or even just connecting them to like a different organization because I know through social media, I've had people from kind of all over the world on our WiFi page just message us and DM us and be like, hey, this is where I'm located. Do you know of our supports? And, you know, you you build all these connections and you find out about the different organizations. Like there's HDSA, there's HSC, there's YPAD, there's NYA, there's stuff in the UK, there's HYO, which is international. Like it's not just one space, it's multiple and it really is a global thing and a global community, even though you're not right next to the person. It's so easy now to be like one text message away from somebody or one DM or whatever you use for support, so. Zoe, I'm curious, to that point, um, you were able to attend Congress last year um, in Glasgow. Pretty convenient for you to participate in that one. Um, yeah. but, uh, 40 minutes from my house, it was great. Yeah, that was, yeah, a lot of us did not have that luxury. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want next time. Yeah, yeah, you'll have a little bit more of a trip. Um, but I'm wondering, because that was that was really the first that was the first global conference just for young people. What was the feeling like being a room full of 340 other people um, who were young people impacted by Huntington's disease, kind of playing off what Hannah said about understanding this global impact and what that means? Um, it was a bit overwhelming to start with. Mm -hmm. But the something that was quite nice was that like you didn't have to do a lot of small talk to then get to like a more serious conversation because like everybody knew why they were there. Everybody had kind of introduced herself already. So like you could just start talking about stuff. Like it wasn't that sort of like, oh, nice weather we're having. Like you didn't have to do that because um, everybody was already, like we knew we all knew why we were there kind of thing. And that was quite nice. Um, but also like um, naturally everybody kind of could tell when people sort of had a line because everybody kind of has a point where they like, they don't want to talk about certain things. And like, I'd never really seen anybody get pushed past that or anything like that. People sort of were quite good at respecting boundaries and stuff like that. Um, and I feel like it was just a sort of a natural thing. Like in conversations, you could kind of be like, right, that person clearly doesn't want to talk anymore. Let's like sort of move around the circle. And it just kind of happened quite nicely. Yeah, because I, I, I think in those environments, because there's, there's safety in strangers too, because you don't have any pretenses of people who know you in, in, in different ways. So it can be really empowering to um, 
message people randomly on social media because they don't know you. So you have that freedom to speak openly, to go into a sea of people because in rare diseases, you often don't get to be in an environment where there are so many people who get it in one small space. Um, but that also does come with some overwhelming tendencies with it too. So I appreciate, I appreciate that feedback because um, uh, it is a part of the journey is to kind of go through some of these things and, um, and, and kind of grow from there. But I do think that there is such a safety in numbers and a safety in strangers with a little bit of that anonymity in there. I'm curious if you um, have ever felt pressured to get further involved or do, uh, you know, Hannah, you talked about this a little bit earlier, um, but did you ever feel pressured to do more and more and get overwhelmed because of those outside things? Or if you've gotten overwhelmed with it, has it been more internal? How did you work through that? Um, yeah, so for me, I did get very overwhelmed um, because I was tackling so much at the same time and my mental health was going downhill. Um, but I kind of just like had an internal battle of like, I feel like I need to do this. I feel like I need to give back to the community. Like my mom and dad have done it in the past before mom got sick. My brother is in the community, super involved. I feel like I had that pressure of like, okay, am, is what I'm doing like caregiving for my mom, is that enough? And I burnt myself out from doing it because I was overcompensating for everything else of like, okay, I want to feel like I am doing everything I'm supposed to. Um, and it did get to the point where I actually had to be admitted into a mental facility um, for a couple of days to just like get that break for myself. So I think it's really, really important to kind of know your boundaries um, and know that like you don't have to do everything to get involved. A simple, you know, like comment on a video or, you know, just talking about HD to a friend or anything like that, like that is getting involved. You are advocating, you are, you know, like there's so many different aspects and ways to do it and you don't have to do it till you burn out. Thank you for sharing that. I think uh, for me uh, talking about the, sorry, I lost my train of thought there actually, come back to me. <laughs> Give me a second. No worries. <laughs> I think it's really easy to feel like you're not doing enough though. Especially, like, there's certain people that are always seem to be doing something. Like, every other month they're doing something, involved in something. And, like, I think it's really easy to be like, why am I, should I be doing stuff like that? I'm not doing stuff like that. But then, like, you don't know what their situation is. Like, it might be that you're working or studying or whatever, so you don't have the time and they're not doing that. So they've got more free time or maybe they've, like, actively chosen to dedicate more time to it for whatever reason. But I think, like, especially on social media, it's really easy to compare yourself. Or like with fundraising things as well. Like I don't know if anybody else has ever done that. Like you're like, oh, I raised a hundred pounds, but this person raised a thousand pounds. You're like, oh, am I doing it wrong? And it's like, well, no, it's just different things. And then maybe they've got a bigger pool of people to connect with or whatever it is. I'm back on track here. Uh, I, for, I forgot the original question. That's why. Um, yeah, I, I I've been lucky enough to have very kind of supporting, for better or worse, uh, outside no outside pressures where all been kind of left up to me and very supportive of how I want to approach things which is kind of I think how it should be because each person is different as we've mentioned uh, a lot of the times here uh, but definitely the internal kind of a little bit of pressure and, and guilt at times maybe that I could be doing more or should be doing more uh, as I mentioned before I kind of took the approach of being being very private about it at first so there was that internal guilt. And especially since I said, like I said, that in the back of my head, I wanted to get involved at some point. Should I be doing more and sooner? Uh, and again, as Hannah kind of pointed out, it's what, uh, or I think a couple of people have said at this point, that whatever you're ready for and you don't know how other people's lives are, right? So balancing that and understanding that some people have more space in their life to do it versus you uh, is important to remember. But yeah, that's... Uh, that internal pressure, I had a little bit of guilt because, as I said, uh, wanting to reach out in the first place, for me, I, I kind of, that private approach was a is a typical male approach to it, and that is kind of the main reason I wanted to do it, is just to be uh, just kind of, kind of a positive male voice, essentially, um, and that's why I do the teaching as well, um, and like a lot of people have already said here a second ago, is that doing that doesn't have to be 
this big ordeal. It, it can just be showing up. It can just be uh, you being present, a visual person, you adding the odd two cents here and there. It doesn't have to be this grand gesture and you'd be surprised how much that kind of snowballs and hopefully gets younger boys going through the same process or young men that might might be thinking the same thing as me and they might get involved a little bit earlier because mm-hmm. I said one or two things, right? So it can snowball from there. You never know the impact that you're having on the smallest of things that you feel like aren't. And then you hear it back from other people, like this little thing mattered so much. I'm like it did. Yeah. And, and it's remember, just amazing. Yeah. I remember after Congress, uh, someone sent me a message on Facebook and they were like, oh, during one of the discussions, you said this, blah, blah, blah. And like, oh, that meant so much to me. And I was like, I was just talking. Like, mm-hmm. I didn't feel like I had said anything profound or particularly interesting. Um, but like they had like that for whatever reason something I had said had resonated with them and I was like but I also really appreciated they took the time to then message me that because I think mm-hmm. it's also easy to just think you're just doing something and like no one cares or no one benefits from it because like especially when it's like online stuff like you can't see the person on the other side of the screen but like you, you kind of are making a difference you just don't always realize. Mm-hmm. For me at camp which was not even a month ago it was like two weeks ago I think now um, I actually had somebody who had told me that they stayed in one of the sessions because they saw that I was there and they said, I knew it was going to be a good session because you were there because you always just know the right questions to ask, to pull stuff out of people. And so that kind of like really hit home for me. And I was like, I really appreciate hearing that. And like, for me personally, I do ask questions because somebody beside me might not be able to ask them. They might be too scared. Do I know the answer to some of the questions I'm asking? Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's not always for me. It's about the person next to me who I know is starting to go through their journey and they don't know this or that it's going to be an important thing for them to listen to and hear that side of the story of somebody, if that makes sense. Absolutely. I think it, it's funny the two different perspectives there where you're on the speaking side where you think, oh, I'm doing this all wrong or like how could anyone care what I'm saying? And then on the other side, it's like, oh, I could never do what they're doing. They're doing such a good job. They know exactly what to say. It just points to the fact that everyone doesn't know what they're doing. They don't feel like they know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Nobody does in anything they do. And and how important it is for other people to still see that. It still works for the people that you're reaching. Absolutely. It's that, I, I feel like we all suffer from a little bit of imposter syndrome, whether it's fear of asking the questions or not knowing what to ask, or am I doing this right? Or, am, am, you know, am I making an impact? But I mean, the reality is that you're doing exactly what you need to do for you at the moment, even if it's asking questions or preserving yourself and then relying on that community to help lift you up where needed too is, is important. And I just want to say that young people in general, and we talk a lot about this, is that those years, you know, 35 and under are the biggest changes of your lives when you're thinking of development and choices and growth and so many different aspects of it, that your first job is to live your life the best that you can. And so taking a break is 100% okay. I can't tell you how many people message me if they've been, if they've had to take a step back or if they feel like they're not doing enough and they message me and say, so sorry that I've been gone or so sorry I haven't responded, you know, all of these things. And it's not because I needed anything from them. It's just because they needed to take a break and and they haven't been as involved as they wanted to be. And they apologize to me. I'm like, no, it is okay. You are living your life and that's what you're supposed to be doing. So, you know, please know that breaks are fine. Stepping back are fine. Um, you know, just also, I would just say to be honest about it, because that helps us understand what your boundaries are. And it also helps us understand, you know, should we reach out to you and just check in just to see how you're doing or, you know, just show that love. So I think that communication is really important, but it's a hundred percent your job to just live your life and, you know, whatever you can do to help support that through getting involved or seeking you know, advice or what have you is, is amazing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for people to know that like HD doesn't have to be your whole life. Mm -hmm. You can be affected by HD, but it doesn't have to control your whole life. Like you are still allowed to live out, you know, your twenties, your whatever, like whatever you want to do as, you know, a quote unquote normal person would be doing like that is so valid. You don't have to be thinking about HD constantly. 
And honestly, I hope you're not because that would be really, really, really stressful mm -hmm. and you wouldn't be able to live your life to the fullest then. Mm -hmm. Any advice that you'd give to, to people or? I think people sometimes um, think when they're asking for support that they're a burden. I think they also don't realise that sometimes that asking for that support, you're giving another person the chance to then use their skills and give their experience, which I think they don't realise can be also really beneficial for the other person. Because um, I don't know about anybody else, I sometimes find it quite cathartic knowing that I've helped someone that was in a situation like me. Um, so like sometimes they feel like, oh, I shouldn't ask them to that because I'm going to be annoying or I'm going to upset them or something like that. But you might actually be doing the exact opposite. Yeah, I kind of, some of the things that I use, um, not in something that would be offsetting, but that fear of asking questions is, is such a thing and, and fear of asking for support. Sometimes, especially if I'm talking about something that's really deep in the weeds for science, I'll say something like, dumb question amnesty, but what is this? Because I'm like, this may be quite up, but I don't know it. And if, you know, just like Hannah said, if you don't know it, someone else probably doesn't know it too. But even too, if you're worried about saying something that maybe is prying a little bit, it's fine to preface it and say, it's okay to not respond. But if you're, if you're open to this, because I don't want to, I don't want you to feel like you have to share something that's too personal, but this is something that I'm just curious about that shows that level of empath empathy and it gives the person that you're speaking to the chance to be able to say, no, I'm okay with it. I'm prepared for it. Or, you know, uh, it might not be right for me at this time to answer that, but can I help point you to someone else who might be able to help you? I think kind of going back to that imposter kind of syndrome too is I, the advice that I'd say is it's going to be when everyone starts anything, it's going to be rocky and you're not going to be feel like you're good at it and you're and you're not going to necessarily be good at it at first, but that's just how you start. And after a little while, you just get a little bit more used to things and it becomes a little bit easier. And if you don't make that first kind of step, then you can't get to the rest of it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think for me, my advice would be don't be scared to talk about it. Don't be scared to talk about HD, even if your family isn't supportive or anything. All of like the HGYO ambassadors, HGYO and all of these organizations, like they're really only one message away. And it could be a simple like, hi, to get you started on getting involved. Um, and like, know that this community is here for you when you are ready. Absolutely. And just to talk a little bit more about that, you're stealing our tagline that I've been putting in social media, Hannah. Um, but part of the thing that HDYO is a part of is that we want to be that international triage, if you will, of saying, let's have a conversation with you. And all we do is talk. We just talk about what's going on, what's important to you, what are you feeling, what's your experiences. And from there, we can make recommendations of either getting you connected with a different association that is in your home country, um, getting connected with individuals who might be able to share stories, mental health professionals, clinicians, whatever that might look like, or you know, additional resources, because the concept is, is that when you're ready to reach out, that's a big thing. And we want to be able to have that conversation with you to say, what's the most important for you? What are you ready to intake? And how do you feel the most comfortable receiving that information? So it's a very no pressure situation and it's done in a way that um, we just want to make sure that you feel the most comfortable. But as Hannah said, it's just an email away and we can have that that conversation no matter where you live in the in the whole globe, because we know that there is there can be differences in access to support and care and um, and those different aspects that when we look at the different cultural and, and, and country dividers as well. Well, thank you all so much for your honesty, your inspiration and sharing your stories. It really makes a big difference. And um, for anybody else that has questions or if you'd like to get further involved with HDYO, please reach out to us and we are all here to support you in whatever that looks like to you. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you soon.